Um, well, our first speaker is Max Isle. Um, he is a member of IJAN, which is the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. Max has a history of organizing and supporting the movement for Palestine for many years. Max is a doctoral student in development sociology at Cornell University. His academic writing has been published in many venues, including Historical Materialism, Merit, and the Journal of Palestine Studies. He has presented at universities in Tunisia and across North Africa, including at Cornell, Columbia, and the University of California, Berkeley. He co-edits the Palestine page at Jadalia. Uh, Max will be uh, opening up this panel to talk about Israel's relationship on the international um, stage and the, um, the, 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 the sort of net effects of this. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass on to uh, Yamila and I will introduce her as well. So uh, if you can give a round of applause for Max, please. Uh, so again, I just want to thank the organizers of this conference because it's really, uh, I'm thoroughly impressed by the conference. I know that uh, organizing conferences like this take an enormous amount of work. So thank you very much to them and to the People's Forum uh, and my, my co-panelist and moderator and everyone involved. So I'm going to be talking about Israel's alliances. Uh, you know, over about the past 100 years or so uh, in order so that we can historicize what is going on currently and understand how it is rooted in history and uh, the history of colonialism on a global scale, the history of global racism, uh, the history of accumulation on a global scale, the history of imperialism. Uh, so we understand exactly or as close as I can approximate to how Israel fits into that process over the long period. Uh, I was inspired uh, by, by uh, Nardine Kiswani, who uh, posted uh, a picture of um, Venezuela's self-appointed uh, non-president, uh, Guido, uh, who said he is working to restore ties with Israel, uh, and he's open to relocating Venezuela's embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, this was, uh, you know, this is not an accident that this is one of his first maneuvers on the world stage. And it's not an accident that this is one of the first things he chooses to do uh, in trying to articulate international alliances, to articulate who he wants to be in alliance with, uh, who his friends are, who his enemies are, and who he wants to throw under the bus, and how he wants to shift the Venezuelan insertion into uh, global geopolitics. It's not an accident at all. It's very important. Similarly, Spiras, who for, uh, you know, was the head of the Syriza party that was supposed to institute uh, socialism and was the great hope of large portions of the Greek left, uh, one of the very first things he did was not only to break with, uh, you know, to retreat on all of Syria's negotiating demands for the Greek people who are absolutely getting destroyed by uh, EU loans and structural adjustment within Greece, but one of the first things he did was he moved to make ever closer ties with Netanyahu and with Israel more broadly to build a security umbrella with Israel and also with Cyprus. Uh, and these were not things that were happening under EU pressure. This was a deliberate choice by the Greek government as it was moving at light speed away from any kind of dissident position and moving into a closer alliance with the EU, which is, of course, the junior partner of the United States. Uh, so we reject any idea of Israel as a puppet master. That's why there's a big X through it for anyone who uh, might choose to get the wrong idea. This is not because Israel is controlling things in the world system. It is not because Israel is controlling the EU. It is not because Israel is controlling the United States. Um, it is more the other way around. It is a question of how Israel was formed from the outset, the ideas the people who founded Israel had, who they wanted to appeal to, uh, and who they wanted to, to build power with. So this is one of, uh, one of Herzl's statements, um, and 
of course, we know that he came from a, a portion of uh, European Jewry that knew absolutely nothing about Judaism at all. That was a very uh, secularized and deracinated or totally ripped from the roots of Eastern European Jewry. He was from Central Europe. Uh, he was thoroughly secular, Central European, um, Eurocentric in outlook. And what he said in selling the idea of a settler colony in Palestine, he said we should there form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. We should as a neutral state remain in contact with Europe, which would have to guarantee our existence. In other words, the basic alliance system of Israel, of Zionism, from the very outset of the project was to build with Europe, uh, and which would eventually uh, be a very smooth transition to building with the United States. So what is Israel as a keystone and symbol is what I'm going to talk about for the remainder. Israel is a symbol of racism, meaning also not just racism internal to nation states, but also racism as a system of justifying inequality between nations. National inequality can also take the form of colonialism. Colonialism meaning that nations don't have the right to self-determine, to be free, to exist, to decide how they're going to develop their own productive forces. Uh, colonialism is also a mechanism for transferring value between poorer and richer nations. So it's taking the resources of the countries which are oppressed and transferring them to the wealthier countries. Um, and this all fits into a system of capitalism which is accumulation on a world scale. We can then see 1948 and how Israel began to fit into the regional Arab state system in 1948 as a, uh, sorry, this, uh, I went through this slide very quickly. Um, I think this is very important and probably and is underemphasized that what, what happened in 1936 to 1939 and why the British poured in a huge percentage, a fifth of their army in order to help put down this revolt in collaboration with the Zionists on behalf of the Zionists. Uh, was that this was a massive anti-colonial populist nationalist class struggle that this is part of why uh, Britain went in to put this down. It also, on the Palestinian side and on the larger Arab side, this inspired widespread support from the surrounding Arab peoples. There were demonstrations. Um, Izzedin al-Qassam, who helped spark this revolt, was actually Syrian, not Palestinian. So this is one of many ways that Palestine was internationalized from uh, from all of its major flashpoints and inflection points, it was an international struggle within the Arab region. And also, of course, on the other side, Zionists were able to call on international and imperial support. We can see then 1948, not only as crystallizing the settler property relationships, in other words, the dispossession of the Palestinian people, but on the other side, it destabilized both the colonial regimes and uh, that were still in place in places like Tunisia, uh, also Egypt, there was a semi-colonial regime, and discredited the existing ruling classes in the Arab world, in part because they had shown very clearly that they were unable to defend the Palestinian cause and Palestinian lands from European uh, Zionist colonial encroachment. On the one hand, this also created a greater split within the kind of Arab currents. Uh, on the one hand, you had an anti-systemic Arab nationalism. This emerged again in, in Egypt, uh, eventually in Syria, uh, in Tunisia. Arab fighters who fought in Palestine went on to lead the national liberation struggle. And on the other side of the coin, you had Arab monarchism, the people who were essentially aligning with Israel. Uh, or would come to align with Israel, uh, even though they would pretend to support Palestine, and this is a function of oil wealth, uh, that they had massive oil wealth, they did not want it to be democratically distributed within the region, uh, therefore they made their bet with Israel and also with, uh, with Europe and especially with the United States that was essential to state formation across the region, but especially in Saudi Arabia, uh, the United States actually essentially built up the Saudi Arabian state. And this is something important to keep in mind when you hear certain people are now talking about the Saudi lobby, just like the Israel lobby that's controlling our politics. It's quite the other way around. Um, the Saudi Arabia is basically a, a creature of the United States. Um, I bring up Tunisia just because I've been there for the last five years. Tunisia was the only Arab republic uh, 
uh, to actually end up aligned with the United States. Uh, and it was the first Arab state to embrace the Eisenhower Doctrine, uh, which was to secure and protect the, the territorial integrity and political uh, independence of nations which wanted aid against uh, international communism. Of course, international communism was just the word they used for any nation that wanted to take control of its resources uh, and try to distribute them more democratically. It was not at all a coincidence that Habib Wargiba, the Tunisian leader, uh, you know, a right-wing authoritarian developmentalist, embraced the two-state solution in 1965, uh, and it was not a coincidence that uh, Tunisia was one of many countries destabilized by the defeat of the Arab armies in 1967. So what we saw then in 1967 was actually a defeat in many ways of the, uh, of the Arab nationalist projects, uh, in some ways that opened space for the left, but it also uh, destroyed these as kind of state projects that were capable of providing for both the well-being of their populations and also opposing the U.S.-Israeli project in the region. What it did was discredit this idea that you could simultaneously redistribute internal wealth and at the same time challenge the U.S. and Israel. This lost credibility in many of these states starting in 1967. Uh, so we saw um, a shift in Syria and a shift from what uh, the major scholars of Syria really call a fusion of Arab nationalism and Leninism, and eventually this give way, gave way to uh, a, an anti-Zionist but also increasingly capitalist dictatorship post-1970. There was a shift in Egypt away from confrontation with Israel and internal uh, redistribution. Um, these states were violently destabilized by the 1967 war. The states that were not violently destabilized in the 1967 war were the major Arab uh, oil monarchies, which were far away and were not involved in supporting an, uh, the anti-Zionist or anti-imperialist projects. So this brings us, uh, you know, and from here, to, for the rest of it, I want to talk a little bit slightly more concretely, but uh, not too concretely, sorry, about Israel's role uh, and what it's doing um, in the region. One, it's defending settler property relationships. It's keeping the land outside of Palestinian lands and in the hands of settlers. Uh, second, it's defending colonialism in principle and in practice. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit with reference to, uh, to Africa. Um, it's defending the principle of inequality between nations, that some nations are allowed to develop, some nations are allowed to have sovereignty within their borders and choose what they do with their affairs, and some nations do not. And of course, Palestine is the ultimate nation that does not have sovereignty and is not allowed, uh, that Palestinians are not allowed to have control over what happens within the borders of, his, of historical Palestine. Uh, some, those things I think are pretty well known. I think what's probably less emphasized uh, is one that they force the regional developmental resources to turn to warfare. Warfare uh, is essentially waste. When a country is buying weapons, either to defend itself uh, or for internal repression, this means it is not using that money for hospitals. So warfare, uh, keen, mil or military keen keenism in the US, this is a system of institutionalized waste for the use of repression. Uh, so when, you know, when states like uh, Syria and also Egypt um, continued to devote their own resources to warfare, this meant that their resources were not being used to build up infrastructure, to build up healthcare systems. This also meant, finally, that there was an increasing pretext uh, and also a reason, and it was both at the same time for the leadership to be able to say, we cannot fully democratize our countries because Israel is on our perimeter. And this is both true and untrue. It was untrue because, of course, the strongest state is going to be one with a democratic uh, revolutionary legitimacy. Uh, on the other hand, it was, uh, it was not a pretext because, okay, that was, this was the model that was available, and these countries were very afraid of Israel attacking their societies. And so they would resort to a uh, kind of aggressive militarization uh, in order to defend their societies, and that would not be democratic, and this would also be part of the reason for their downfall. So post-1967, because of Israel's utility in shattering the Arab nationalist states, it had a massive military buildup. 
This was funded almost entirely by the U.S. The U.S. started funneling aid. Uh, U.S. corporations started to get highly active in Israel from 1967, especially from 1970 on. Uh, there was systematic joint ownership. Um, there was systematic um, kind of essentially outsourcing of a lot of the lines of military production from the U.S. to Israel. Uh, and what that did was it built up a sizable domestic military infrastructure in Israel, at first primarily public, and a, but which would eventually be to some extent privatized. So when we talk about uh, the Israel lobby, the Israel lobby, a lot of it are people who want to push along this military infrastructure uh, to build up these joint projects to the benefit of the ruling classes, both in Israel and also, of course, in the United States. Um, another major asset that are uh, that uh, a role that Israel played or has played on the process of global accumulation and global colonialism is military sales to settler Africa. So what it was doing again on an international scale, it's defending settler property relationships. It's defending the land staying in a, the hands of a tiny white minority and not being in the hands of the huge black poor indigenous majority in countries like Rhodesia, which I had to put in. Uh, in quotation marks, because it's Zimbabwe, um, and also South Africa, uh, and Israel would also be part of circumventing uh, congressional restrictions on aid to South Africa later. Israel was absolutely central to propping up these settler regimes as long as possible, uh, and, and making it as hard as possible to, uh, for the indigenous national liberation forces to democratize these countries. Um, additionally, of course, normalization with Israel would also be a way or a segue or a way that states would lubricate their shift from uh, being opposed to the U.S. or at least a kind of positive neutralism uh, with respect to the U.S. to being pro-U.S. So the peace treaty with Egypt was part of transitioning Egypt into the pro-U.S. camp. This was Camp David, and we're talking about the Israeli peace treaty uh, with Israel. Um, and it was, this would actually really be a long process because of the resilience of Arab nationalism. Uh, so it really took until 1990, 1991 for Egypt to line up behind uh, the U.S. in supporting the war in Iraq. And this was in exchange for debt forgiveness. And alongside that went uh, neoliberalization of Egypt. So we see these, uh, these phenomena are kind of articulating in a helix or in a spiral. They're interacting with one another. So... Uh, the more states lined up with the U.S.-Israeli agenda on an international scale would also mean that they would more aggressively dispossess their own populations and weaken their populations, uh, and this would then weaken the entire basis for any future resistance project. Um, <clears throat> throughout, this, you know, throughout the 70s and 80s, Israel also carried out mil uh, systematic military assistance to both the Southern Cone, the fascist dictatorships, uh, and also Latin America and Central America. They supplied weapons to the fascist and extremely anti-Semitic Argentinian dictatorship, which particularly targeted, uh, disproportionately targeted leftist Jews during this period. And they supplied the Central American sub-fascist states with uh, machinery of repression, training, weapons. So this helped carry out systematic counter-revolution or fascist uh, social control all across Latin America during the 1970s and 1980s. This is nothing new. Um, this is what Israel has done, and this is also its role that it carries out these things because sometimes there's enough resistance in the U.S. to make it so that it's very hard for the U.S. to carry out these policies because of public resistance. Therefore, it can subcontract them to Israel. Um, I think on a, on a broader level, and I'm getting to the close, is that Israel is a symbol and practice of pro-systemic forces. When I say pro-systemic, I mean pro-racist, I mean pro-capitalist, I mean pro-imperialist, and I mean pro-colonial. So one really telling example is that India, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, and especially post-1992 with the rise of global neoliberalism, moved into an ever closer alliance with Israel, which broke from its historic anti-colonial stance. Uh, and we especially see this now with Modi. So we see the rise of kind of authoritarian neoliberal dictator near dictatorship, very chauvinist, very uh, anti-Muslim in India. We see this developing, and we also see Israel as one of the major military providers to the Modi government. 
we also see this uh, in the same with Bolsonaro, who has moved very aggressively to build ties with Israel. And this is, of course, where is Bolsonaro? Bolsonaro is the Brazilian president who is there after a U.S.-backed judicial coup against the populist Lula government, which was much stronger uh, alliance with Palestine and was really uh, was like the other Latin American governments, was defending Palestine on a world scale. So here, Palestine is inseparable from what's going on domestically. It's both symbol of it and it's also an output of it. When the social struggles domestically are beaten back, the state is able to move into a closer alliance with Palestine, uh, with Israel, and the more it moves into a closer alliance with Israel, it's giving a good signal to international capital and global racism that it wants to carry out their agenda. Um, again, I think here we see that Israel and the U.S. are continuing to target the regional forces which oppose Israel. This does not mean that these forces are all uniformly good, but it does mean that Israel, they are opposing the Israeli colonial project. This is something that is very important when we try to understand ourselves here in America, how to orient to uh, these, this array of regional forces. So these are the, this is uh, taken directly from the terror list which uh, are the, the list of prescribed so-called terrorist organizations, which uh, the U.S. created as part of the Oslo process, which was part of the process of imposing a Palestinian uh, Versailles or a surrender on the Palestinian people. Um, so, of course, we see Hamas, Hezbollah, the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, uh, Palestine Liberation Front, Palestine Islamic Jihad, Popular Front, and most recently, uh, about a month ago, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is actually uh, in Iran, which is one of the major pillars of the Iranian economy. In essence, they're saying that the Iranian economy is a terrorist organization and it is illegal. Um, and this is, again, part of the U.S. broader project of throwing back the 1979 revolution, which removed Iran from the U.S. camp and started to divert oil resources to the population through rural health care, uh, through industrial developmentalism, uh, and Iran has one of the largest per capita production of university graduates and publications in the world, let alone the region. Uh, this is about throwing back that project with all of its lights and shadows. Um, and of course, this should be self-explanatory. Here we have Maduro. Um, what is Maduro standing here for? Not just Palestine, but also standing for a political project which, of course, has systematically given sight to people who are blind, uh, built up a uh, process of uh, systems of uh, national health care, and basically reversed the historic process through which Venezuelan uh, oil monies were looted uh, and sent both to the Venezuelan upper class and also sent to Miami and the United States. Uh, what the Venezuelan uh, project did, the Proceso did, was start to reverse those processes in important ways. That is why it's under assault and uh, it is also under assault precisely because Maduro is very willing, uh, enthusiastic about putting on the kafia as a symbol of where he stands on a world scale. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll introduce the next panelist. Her name is Yamila Shannon, Dr. Yamila Shannon. Dr. Yamila Shannon is a scholar, an educator, an activist, a public speaker dedicated to social, economic and political justice. Her work examines the matrixes of oppression and liberation, particularly institutionalized and structural supremacy, anti-black racism and settler colonialism. Dr. Hussein Shannon teaches at the graduate level on the intricacy between language, power and in, in parentheses, justice out parentheses and critical race theory. Her courses examine how structures and institutions sustain and reproduce systems of oppression and the centrality of our political clarity in contributing to liberation and the creation of a just world. Prior to doctorate work, Dr. Hussein Shannon founded and ran Yamita Activity Center for Children, co-founded the Teacher Creativity Center and worked for Defense for Children International in Palestine. She has designed, directed, and taught intensive academic programs for teachers and developed curricula in Boston, Harvard University, Goddard College, Lesley University, and UMass Boston, and internationally in Morocco, Jordan, Spain, Palestine, Mexico, and in the Balkans. A Palestinian born in Colombia and raised in, Jeru raised in Jerusalem, and currently residing in Boston, 
Uh, she is trilingual in Spanish, Arabic, and English. And I'll pass it on to Yamila, so give her a round. Thank you. It's a little bit intimidating to follow a presentation like this. I'm not an economist, and I don't know much about that stuff. I'm a Palestinian who grew up in Palestine, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how Israel's policies intentionally underdeveloped, de-developed whatever economic structure we had in Palestine before 1967. And I'm going to talk about it from a little bit of research, but mostly from my personal experiences, what I've witnessed. I'm going to try to keep it short and then answer your questions. So 1967, up to 1967, the West Bank and Gaza were under Jordanian and Egyptian um, rule. And when uh, the Israeli military takes over, one of the first things that Israel does, other than messing with our education system, is bans every agreement that we have in terms of import and export. They're just banned, categorically banned. We're not allowed to export or import anything. Alongside with that, and this is like the first few months of the military rule, and alongside with that, Israel continues uh, stealing land, and land, land is not only important for, for Palestinians in terms of our symbolic and our roots and our everything, land becomes an important aspect of economic underdevelopment and expulsion of people, particularly people who have the potential of contributing to a local economy. So what it does is it drains the country from the people who could potentially run an economy and um, puts a halt on any possibility for the development of any local independent economy in the West Bank. In the course of a few years, it goes more proactively against Palestinian infrastructure. So for example, if you had, if you were, um, you know, the merchant uh, class in Palestine, they had no way to communicate with anybody other than through Israel. So they would import raw materials only through Israel, from Israel. And the Palestinian uh, business class, sort of not necessarily yet fully capitalist, ends up becoming a subcontractor to the Israeli economy. So I want to start a factory. The only way for me to get the machines, the only way for me to, get to, do, to, um, to create my factory is by buying my uh, machinery and raw material um, by Israel directly, or if it's not produced by Israel, it was imported by Israel. So now Israel is doing, making double, triple profit on that, and our um, people are paying double, triple the size of things. Taxes become another important tool where Israel imposes taxes on everything Palestinians do, including, for example, our universities are not exempt from taxes, even when they are private, non-for-profit. So if you want to ship books to a university in Palestine, even if it's a donation, Palestinian universities have to pay taxes on it. So you see, taxes becomes another way, which we know historically throughout history, um, taxes become another way through which the state imposes its control on the local population and continues preventing the possibility of the development of any economic infrastructure. In the 80s, one of the things that was easily accessible for Palestinians, um, we are farmers, um, or we used to be when we had um, full control over the land. So um, farming was, was a key, a key um, element in our local economy. And Palestinians, for example, in Jericho and in uh, Hebron and in some parts of the, of the nation, uh, they start o uh, their own um, factories to produce dairy. Uh, yogurt, and I don't know if you know, labne is something that Palestinians do that's somewhere between yogurt and cheese. Um, it's it's uh, delicious. You know, and milk and basic dairy products. So here's for one example of how Israel does that. This was probably in the um, late 80s. First, there is a huge media campaign where supposedly the Israeli inspection decided that these factories were not hygienic enough. This is after these factories had to jump through multiple loopholes to even come to existence and trying to maintain themselves. Second, Israel subsidizes Jewish farmers so they can sell the same products for significantly less money in Palestinian um, territories, in our markets. And it prevents any Palestinian product from being marketed inside of uh, what is referred to as Israel. 
What it does is it launches a campaign against any local attempt to create any independent economic infrastructure. During the Intifada of 1987, one of the main things that sustained the Intifada for years was a call to boycott Israeli products, and in order for that to work, was we started creating our own economic projects, some of them as small as four or five women getting together and making jam, some of them much bigger scale. And again, same policy. Our products are banned, Jewish farmers get subsidies, so now we can't compete in the market, and the Palestinians who can buy our products are the ones who have enough money to pay double or triple the, the, the price, which requires both belonging to a certain ca class and having certain income, in addition to political clarity and intentional decision making. So in the process of, and, and it is important to keep in mind that this is not simply the um, capitalist way of doing things. This is a settler colonial project. It is intimately connected to land theft and um, the expulsion of the natives, in addition to, of course, killing and imprisonment, also expulsion of the nations. Israel controlled all our banks in the um, 1987 Intifada. You could not receive, uh, for example, if you, uh, somebody sent you money from abroad, if it was anywhere over $30, what would be like now $30, $40 today, you needed a military permit to go retrieve your money from a bank. Likewise, um, so then Palestinians would revert to, for example, the um, money exchange um, business people. So it's not really banks, but it's like in here would be now Western Union and all of those things. So it was a constant game, or maybe not game is not the right word. It was a constant struggle between Palestinians and the Israeli government trying to stifle our economy and we trying to find other ways to do it until Oslo happens. Oslo seals that, um, that door. In the, Oslo, in the very same Oslo agreements, forget the actual, what happens if, afterwards, Israel officially gets the Palestinians to agree to Israel's control over our borders, our import and export, what we farm, what we grow, what not. So Palestinian farmers are now totally hostage to Israeli decisions about what we can farm and what we can market, what gets exported. There's no import whatsoever. And we end up becoming an economy that doesn't have an actual base of production. We become a hostage market to Israeli products with no alternative for us to produce what we know how to produce or even to venture into new areas of capital. So this is the, the gist of the story. I'll answer more questions um, as if anybody has. But the alliances that Israel is building around the world are also bringing, are also impacting the way we live our daily lives inside of Palestine. The last thing I want to say is that also Israel also imposed its ideas around education, not only inside historic Palestine, but also across the country. So for example, Palestinian refugees in uh, Lebanon are banned from certain professions. That also mirrors the way Palestinians inside 1948 are banned from certain professions. And Israel goes and uh, dictates the Palestinian, the cu curricula that's used for Palestinian students West Bank and Gaza, and through its control of UNRWA, the UN uh, branch responsible for Palestinian refugees, also the curricula that's being used for Palestinian refugees in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. When you control education, you're also having a lot of control over what these people are learning and what professions they can get to. And that also contributes to brain drain and Palestinians leaving the country and even the region in pursuit of education and therefore also employment. I'm going to leave it at that, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Um, I, just asked, I just want to ask the panelists two questions before we go to the floor. Um, the first one is to Max. Um, so as part of my, uh, my PhD studies, I'm studying border control and border security. And last month I went to San Antonio, the San Antonio Border Security Expo. And it's a meeting 
of all of the bad eggs in this country. There was Ron Vitello, who was, the head, who was tipped to be the head of ICE, but he's too soft. There were people from CBP. Sorry? Is it too loud? No. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everyone. Everyone from CBP, wherever. And they, they meet in one conference room, and they talk about how to best reinforce the border at the southwest co sort of corridor and internally through policy. And then there is an expo hall outside where a lot of them were actually look like hipsters from Brooklyn selling their like technology or whatever because a lot of it gets outsourced. But many of them were from these huge conglomerates, Lockheed Martin, um, Airbus. <coughs> Who was there in droves? It was Israeli border security technicians and um, strategists. Uh, Elbit Systems is one you all might have heard of, but there are also low-level ones like startups that actually exist in what is called the Silicon Wadi, which is in the Nakab, which is where a lot of the um, technology sector is actually expanding, of course, at the expense of the Bedouins. So my question to Max is, is could you expand a little bit more on Israel's relationship with border security and policing in this country. We know they have a relationship with the NYPD, if you could maybe expand a little bit more on that, and how they're actually having, Israelis are actually having a direct hand in the policing of black and brown communities in this country as well. Um, and Yamila, my, my question to you is, um, obviously this economic encroachment or this economic domination, it's happening with a certain amount of complicity from the Palestinian leadership. We've yes. got a panel which will be talking more about this uh, with Nora Erekat later, but I'm wondering if you could give your own impressions on that as well. So, in terms of, uh, I mean, what Israel is doing in terms of its repressive and uh, population control policies at its uh, armistice lines, because it has no borders, uh, are a very valuable asset to the rest of the world's repressive forces, especially the main, the world's you know, most powerful repressive force, which is the United States. Um, essentially, you know, capitalism relies on free flow of capital and not free flow of people. It relies on constricting the flow of people um, and uh, making sure that they cannot move freely and, uh, um, and undermine uh, national systems of accumulation. So this is actually a very fundamental aspect. And in this, as in many ways, all these uh, an aspect any kind of functional mechanism of capitalism requires, uh, it needs a certain set of technologies to carry out. Israel, because of its long-standing experience carrying out a process of colonial population control, uh, has a very advanced practice and a very advanced technological base for carrying out what, uh, for helping the U.S. do what it needs to do on its own uh, southern borders as it seeks to harden that border and carry out uh, carry out exclusion of immigrants from Central America and uh, South America. So it's not just, it's also, um, it's helping to, to build the wall. Uh, there's, uh, the construction companies are very similar. And these are all just a variety of corporations. A lot of them are jointly owned by the U.S. and uh, by U.S. investors or people with dual citizenship between the U.S. and Israel. So it's really a, a lot of it is in fact a transnational uh, elite that's kind of moving between these two countries. Um, and helping to invest and manage the process of population control. I think it's very similar uh, in terms of the policing of black and brown communities, but I think also in a way the, in a way the symbolism is probably, is in some ways more powerful than the actual practice um, in the sense that these people go there to signal that they were, are willing to uh, carry out a more enhanced form of repression in the United States. It is not new that U.S. police forces are carrying out repression of black and brown communities. Uh, this is why police forces were essentially founded, was in order to defend settler property relationships uh, and to continue to defend, uh, to keep certain communities more repressed than others, which therefore uh, produces racism and keeps people separate from one another. So I think uh, that does happen. I mean, at Cornell University in 2011, our uh, head of ch campus police went over to uh, Occupy Palestine and learned what she called techniques of counter-terrorism for Ithaca campus, where the most dangerous thing is uh, 
you know, falling in the lake um, is not a dangerous place. And she learned, literally, they printed in the campus newspaper that she learned techniques of counterterrorism, and she learned how to balance the needs of protecting the community with freedom of academic expression. Uh, campus police, of course, should not be involved in determining uh, who is involved in, who has the right to freedom of academic expression uh, on a university campus or, in fact, anywhere. Um, so, of course, the university is, uh, you know, endowed by lots of billionaires. It's endowed by Seth Claremont, in fact. Uh, the university, uh, insofar as people are making an investment in a university, they want to a return on that investment, which means that they want to increase their wealth. And so, a lot of the university, and just like the police force, is going to carry out those things anyway. But I think uh, the back and forth between the two police forces, uh, or between the two settler states, is a way of affirming that on the symbolic level and uh, signposting to people, again, who the friends are and who the enemies are. Thank you, Max. The only thing I would add to that is um, we also, uh, Ferguson, in 2014, and although the oppression of black and brown communities is not new, uh, Baltimore and Ferguson showed us a new level of uh, not even trying to pretend. The militarization of what's supposed to be um, a democracy, this is when the wolves showed their teeth explicit, and that's part of why and how a lot of white liberals in the US for them, that was the beginning of them understanding the oppression of black and brown communities in a different way. To your question um, about the Palestinian, um, the local, let's put it this way. Throughout its, the history of uh, revolutions in Palestine, the Palestinian middle class, particularly the merchants and manufacturers, um, were always very reluctant in contributing to and participating in any mass popular revolutions. They have their interests to protect, and their interests are not necessarily tied to national liberation. Their interests are, are tied with where they can do their business in the easiest way for the most profit. 1987 Intifada was the first time that the Palestinian merchant and manufacturer, that, that class of people, that was the first time that they were engulfed in the mass popular movement. That was very serious for Israel. Because as long as the Palestinian peasants and the Palestinian students are the ones in the street, there is a way to manage that. But once you have a large segment of the uh, community now engaged in resisting the occupation, particularly when you have segments like the merchants and the manufacturers, now you're, you're creating a big economic potentially a big economic shift. That, uh, there is a web, if you look at the history of that uh, class in Palestinian society, it's, it webs up and down, but in 1987 is the first time that there is a very explicit participation. We got them on our side, basically. This starts eroding that um, temporary position that the merchants took starts eroding and gets sealed back into their place, starting with the Oslo Agreement. The way Oslo was designed and the actual agreement, the text of Oslo, and there is a panel on that and we'll get more details about it. The devil is in the details, it's in the annexes. The annexes of the Oslo Agreement were where a lot of these seeds were planted that then get discussed in future um, uh, whatever agreements that they did. The Palestinian, um, in that class becomes a little bit wider because now two more things happen after Oslo, when now there's talk about peace and there's talk about we achieved our goals. One is the enjoyization of the Palestinian local popular movement. So those people who were well known, very solidly uh, uh, um, standing um, leaders of popular movements now are given money to start an NGO. So we had a joke in the mid 90s where every Palestinian, for every three Palestinians there is an NGO. That wasn't a coincidence, that was part of the political pro project to co-opt the movement and to empty it from its content. So all of a sudden this 
person with whom I've been struggling for years and we've been comrades in the fight for years now has an NGO and now is telling me that Palestinian people are the problem why his NGO is not doing well. Because he wants to teach them about democracy. While we're still under occupation, we're supposed to now be uh, learning and talking about democracy. But then the only way for him to get people to participate in his workshops is by paying them um, money so that they can come to his workshops. He has no capacity of understanding that people don't attend workshops when they're not meaningful for them, when they're not relevant, right? He does, has no historic mem memory of how we used to do the work when at a time any three Palestinians gathered together was considered illegal. And we still managed to have our meetings and conversations and organizing work with the hundreds of people in a room when people knew that they could be put to jail for joining those meetings. And right after Oslo, that's one of the main things that happens. You take the leaders, you give them money, they start their NGO, now their salaries are tied into that, their income, their status, everything, and now you dictate the agenda of what matters or not. We had a Canadian uh, funder come to our organization. I used to work for Defense for Children International. And we had a Canadian woman come to us and tell us that the project that we, sh we could get money for was on Palestinian neglect of our children. And at that point, I was like, what do you mean? And she says, well, everywhere I go, there are children walking in the streets and playing on their own with no adult supervision. And I said, yeah, that's called community safety. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a problem that we need to resolve. That's an indication of how safe we feel with each other and how safe our children are playing in the streets and in the neighborhoods. And also the fact that when I was little and I was playing down in the streets and I was hungry, I would knock on any door and say I'm hungry. Sometimes we didn't have to knock because the auntie would show up with sandwiches and say, you guys have been playing here for five hours, you haven't eaten. She doesn't know us, we don't know her. She knows our parents. So this is then how through the creation of the NGOs, which I call the NGOization of the popular movement, that becomes one of the ways that also the, the intellectual slash popular slash activist class gets co-opted into the project. Now, similarly, as a merchant or a manufacturer, all of a sudden, I actually have access to contracts. So now, my, my aim is to make profit. Now, for the first time, I actually have the permission, both through Oslo, therefore, officially Palestinian permission, but also through Israeli policies, now I can go and become a subcontractor for Israeli big manufacturers, sometimes the state, sometimes private business. And now I get to employ people, and people are working in my project because Palestinians at that point are no longer being allowed to work the usual uh, jobs that they had. Peasants are now um, having difficulties because their land has been stolen from them. And Palestinian workers who in the 70s and 80s had relatively a way, however exploitative it was, could work in what was considered um, at that point, um, you know, um, good paying jobs, no longer could do that. So this is another way through which the Palestinians themselves become part of it. Now the Palestinian Authority is its own different story. One of my uh, last memories before I, I moved to the U.S. There was this whole campaign about boycotting um, Israeli and American cigarettes. And those of us who are smokers really care about our cigarettes. <laughs> we don't just buy any, any cigarette that we have. We have our type and we go do that. So we uh, still naively um, participated and contributed to the boycott. And the idea was that we're buying local cigarettes. I mean, it's, it's all poison, but you know, we're, we're doing the economic piece. And then, after the PA, the Palestinian Authority, cleans up all the local markets from Israeli and American cigarettes, the market is flooded again with American and Israeli um, cigarettes. And two things you notice. One is the American cigarettes have gone through Israel. Israel imports the American cigarettes and then sells them to the Palestinian um, merchants. And two, the Israeli cigarettes are now flooding the market at a significantly lower price that Palestinian local cigarettes cannot compete with. 
So here you see the Palestinian Authority itself was established from the beginning, from its inception, as um, we used to call them CEOs. They didn't act or sound like liberation movement or leaders of a nation. The whole of the West Bank and Gaza becomes transformed into a factory being run if actually still by the Israeli regime, but now through the mediation of this Palestinian middle class or upper class. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're going to go to uh, questions. Get this lady in the red. Uh, she can kick them off. Um, just tap the mic to make sure it's on. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're on. We're good. There's a, um, a social justice uh, pro-Palestinian organization in Brooklyn that sells Palestinian olive oil. So I'm wondering, like, what is the mechanism to get Palestinian olive oil or any Palestinian products into the United States? I don't know the way an economist would know, but I'm going to tell you my experience. Uh, so we Palestinians are very fond of our olive oil. And, um, you know, when we're little and, and walking in, this, in the streets and you hear our mother fighting with our neighbor, and you know how sometimes you, you tell people nasty things? One of the nasty things that you would hear our elders tell each other is, I hope you have to buy oil. <laughs> because for a Palestinian peasant, that feels like one of the worst things that could ever happen to you. Because we are, we, oil for us is not, not, not only substance, there's a lot of pride and history and it has a huge symbolic meaning. And we, we actually, like, there's, a, there's an issue with that because Palestinian refugees who have to buy, the, buy their own oil, you, you know, so it's a big deal. So every time I come to the US from Palestine, I wanna bring my own oil with me. Like my, my family still has some olive trees and I want my oil. And um, the first couple of times I managed to do it, I had it with my, you know, on my purse. And afterwards it was banned and it took many, many years. And the way I know how to do it is Palestinians can send some of their oil to Jordan and from Jordan it gets exported into the US. So for a few years, I was buying oil that supposedly was Jordanian, but I knew it was Palestinian. And I mean, we Palestinians can know from the taste. <laughs> like you taste it and you know it's ours or it's not. Now I know that there are certain people, including um, Susie Abul Hawa, she's gonna be here on a panel uh, soon enough. You can ask her that question. She is involved in making sure that they receive oil that's um, directly from Palestinian farmers to be sold in the US as direct as possible. She will know more about the process, but I'm using oil, olive oil in particular, because of the big meaning that it has for us um, in, in Palestine and the, the controversies that it has created. When I go to a supermarket and they're telling me Lebanese oil and I taste it, I'm like, no, it's not Lebanese, this is ours. But then on the one hand, I actually wanna eat oil, but on the other hand, I don't want my oil to be marketed as Lebanese. So, um, but, but that's as far as I know. Um, of the things that I noticed when I read the actual text, um, we agreed to never have our own national bank, which means we will never have our own currency, which means we will never have our own state. You cannot have a nation state. The way nation states are configured, um, it necessitates a central bank and your own currency in order for you to be state. That was in the Oslo agreement. That's not something that, you know, we keep talking about how Israel did not respect Oslo, how Israel did not follow the agreement. I'm talking about the agreement. We also agreed in Oslo, we, my leadership agreed in Oslo, that Israel will always have control over the borders. Borders within the country and around the country. We also agreed that we will never have an army. We also agreed that Israel determines exports and imports, supposedly through a joint committee. So Oslo itself set the parameters. There was nothing much new 
what was new was Palestinian leadership approving and agreeing to do it, and therefore Palestinian leadership becoming responsible for making sure that Israel gets what it wants. So if you listen to the guy who's still playing president of Palestine, or whatever they call him, Mahmoud Abbas, he refers, I mean, his presidency expired years ago, if, if we want to talk about that. But he keeps talking about collabor no, um, coordination, security coordination with Israel. He keeps referring to it as sacred. Sacred. He talks about the Palestinian authorities coordination and collaboration with the Israeli state as sacred. And they actually mean it and believe it. And part of it is for there is money to be made. So the telecommunication system in Palestine is a subcontractor of the Israeli communication system. And so they are making money. There are the, the, this comprador class, this intermediate class. And I think what I'm trying to say is Oslo didn't necessarily brought that much new on that front. It solidified it and it made it legal, thus shattering the political and ideological discourse that told us, the people, that this is not okay. Now all of a sudden this is our only option. So I go to cross the border. I know that the border is still controlled by Israeli soldiers. I know that for a fact. However, I'm interacting with a Palestinian person dressed in police. But I know that that Palestinian person has no control over where, whether or not I can go through or, or not. So it, it creates that intermediate layer. Yeah. Uh, lady of the uh, hat. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Asantwa Ikuma Ture. Um, my question is for Max. Given what you said in your presentation, how does Israel's continued occupation of the Golan Heights tie into that? And also, do you have any updated information about Israel's relationship to supporting repression regimes in Latin America, looking at what's going on in Venezuela now? In terms of what's going on in the, in the Golan Heights, uh, I mean, Israel is holding on to that land. And we know in general that Israel has not ceded back any land to Arab sovereignty except by means of uh, direct war or uh, some form of guerrilla resistance from the surrounding Arab populations. Um, so Israel, I think, will hold on to the, the Golan Heights until it is forced somehow to relinquish it. Um, and in the interim, it's also a powerful security buffer, especially it's a strategic location. So Israel has a lot of interest in that. Israel also has an interest in trying to break the uh, Syrian Arab identity of the populations there. It's been enormously unsuccessful. Uh, there are Syrian, I know that there are Syrians there who are on both sides of the varying shades of Syrian opinion on what's been going on internal to Syria, but there's an enormous amount of unity on rejecting um, the, is, the attempts by Israel to rob them of their Arab-Syrian identity. So I think it's, uh, it's a sustained military occupation, um, and it's one of many things that needs to stop. Um, thank you. Just one more round of applause for the...